Dear Father, we thank you so much for the life of your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you so much that he came as the Messiah of Israel, that he offered the kingdom to them in the first century, and that he offered himself as a sacrifice for the sin of mankind. We thank you that he was faithful unto death, and we thank you that by his blood we are cleansed of our sins. We pray these things to your glory in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, well, I don't have a full presentation for you this morning, but we do have a full study. So hopefully you grab the notes packet because about halfway through, we're going to have to make use of those. It does take me about an hour and a half to two hours to make a presentation. So sometimes it just doesn't come together on time. So this evening we are looking at the trial of Jesus Christ, where he stood trial before the religious leaders, and the Roman civil leaders. There are six different stages to these two different kinds of trials, and in none of them was Jesus fairly tried. In fact, he is at the end sentenced to death without a guilty verdict. He is sentenced to death despite his innocence. So this moves us into our ninth section, the trial of the king, which begins with his arrest. He was arrested the same night that they celebrated the Last Supper. While he was on the mountain or the Mount of Olives in the Garden of Gethsemane, they had used Judas to discover his location because as Luke told us, Jesus followed the same routine every single evening. From the time of his triumphal entry until his arrest, it was his habit to spend the day in Jerusalem teaching at the temple and then to travel home that night by way of the Mount of Olives on his way to Bethsaida. We got to visit him on one of those evenings, a Tuesday evening, when he delivered a great prophetic discourse to four of his disciples. And then this, two days later, a Thursday evening, the night of the Passover, Nisan 14, Judas knew exactly where he would be. The religious leaders needed Judas in order to show them where he would be so that they could arrest him away from the crowds. It was the Passover, and tensions were naturally already flared. The Jews that sought to throw off the Roman, uh, the Romans would not like the Jews participating with the Romans. And those who followed Jesus the Messiah, they feared that they would riot. And so they wanted to arrest Jesus in secret, but they did not want to arrest him on the Passover either. Remember that Jesus forced the hand of these religious leaders by exposing the traitor Judas. These trials were rushed. They had to happen that night. They had to have a verdict by morning. Jesus had to be dead as soon as possible before the people got wind of what was going on. Otherwise, they would have an uprising on their hands, which was not uncommon, especially around Passover feasts in the first century. In fact, Pilate himself and Herod in the north had already presided over two similar riots in the Passover. They wanted everything to avoid this. As soon as Jesus was finished praying, when he had come to his disciples that were sitting with him near the gate of the garden, just a few feet away from him and had woken them up, he told them there's no use praying anymore in the sense that what you were supposed to be praying for is already at hand. The events that are about to take place are here, and because you failed to pray, you are going to scatter. Judas was already at the garden, and he brought with him a Roman cohort. A Roman cohort is anywhere from 400 to 600 soldiers. There was a massive number of people together with Judas at the garden. In order for Judas to obtain such an army of troops, he would have needed to go to Pilate himself, present a conviction for which Pilate would release this cohort to Judas to make the arrest. Judas already presented to Pilate a conviction that he would bring against Jesus, and he would stand as witness. At least that was the plan. 
we'll notice in this arrest and trial of Jesus that the Jews break a considerable number of their own laws. Many of them are Mosaic laws, specifically detailed in the very book that Jesus kept perfectly. Others of those were laws on the books in the land that were derived from the Mosaic law. Some were Mishnaic laws. Ironically, those laws which Jesus had broken, but the Pharisees claimed to keep, they themselves would break in order to convict Jesus. The first that was broken was directly from the Mosaic law. No arrest was to be made that came from a bribe. Judas, in effectuating this arrest, was breaking the Mosaic law, and all those who participated with him were also breaking the Mosaic law. No part of any criminal proceedings were to occur at night. John told us specifically that Judas had left in the night. Jesus and the other disciples had gone up to the Garden of Gethsemane, and they were praying at night. Judas arrived still at night in order to make the arrest. This is part of the criminal proceedings. It broke the rabbinic laws to begin this criminal process at night. The idea here is to avoid conspiracy. That is exactly what was occurring, and that is exactly why they used the shade of darkness. They couldn't wait any longer because their plot would be exposed if they had to wait. Additionally, no judges were allowed to participate in this arrest. The judges that would stand over Jesus in his trial would be the Sanhedrin made up of 48 Pharisees, both scribes and elders, and 25 Sadducees, one being the high priest and the other being, or the chief priest and the other 24 being high priests. Yeah, high priests. And we see that the elders and the scribes were present at this arrest, and even a representative of the high priest, Caiaphas, was present there as well. His name was Malchus. He came as a representative of the high priest, and this broke this law because the judge already sided with the arresting forces. He was supposed to be a neutral party. When this cohort arrives, Jesus speaks first and asks them who they are looking for. They tell him, we are looking for Jesus of Nazareth. And now our English Bibles do a good job of smoothing the translation, but unfortunately they lose the impact of Jesus' statement in doing so. Because Jesus did not say, I am he, he simply said, I am. In doing so, he was claiming to be God. He was giving this Roman cohort his very name that he had given to Moses centuries earlier. Jesus is the Shekinah glory, the physical representation of God, the physical manifestation. He was in the bush that spoke to Moses. And when Moses asked his name, he also told Moses, I am. Tell them that I am sent you. When Jesus gave this Roman cohort his name, they all fell backwards. The power and the authority of his name would overcome them just by speaking his name. We see right from the beginning that they had no power to arrest him unless that power was permitted to them. Jesus was in complete control of the situation. While they're down, he asks them again, who are you looking for? They said, Jesus of Nazareth, and this time he says, I am he. Now Jesus has made two statements about himself. He has claimed to be God, his very name is I Am, and now he claims to be Jesus of Nazareth. Necessarily, that would be one person. This person, Jesus Christ, is both God and the man, Jesus Christ. He is the God-man. This would be incredibly important for the following day's events, because only a perfect man, the God-man, could die for the sins of the world. 
Once again, Peter's not having any of this. Before, when Jesus had first predicted his death at the hands of the Romans, Peter had said, absolutely not. And Jesus' response to him was, get behind me, Satan. Here, once again, Peter wants to stop Jesus from going to the cross. And he takes out a sword that just a few moments earlier, Jesus had told them that when he's gone, they're going to need to take swords with him. And Peter produced a sword and said, like this one. Now, just like Chekhov's gun, we see the sword come into play. Peter takes the sword and strikes Malchus, the high priest's emissary. Now, it looks like Peter might not be that good a swing. He either missed by a few inches and took off Malchus' ear. Otherwise, Malchus might have been wearing a helmet, in which case the sword ricocheted off his helmet and took off his ear. In any case, Jesus stops Peter. He tells him that he's not going to stop what is happening because it's been prophesied. The events that were about to take place could not be stopped from taking place. They were the divine prerogative of God. He also taught Peter that spiritual battles are not fought with physical means. Had Jesus wanted to be spared from the cross, had this been the will of God, Jesus had at his disposal 12 legions of angels that could stop the Roman cohort easily. He did not call these into play because this was not the will of God. And then he told Peter that those who live by the sword die by the sword. Spiritual matters aren't to be fought with the sword. A sword would be for the physical protection, but never for, for these spiritual battles. This was a spiritual battle that was taking place in Jerusalem on Nisan 14. The religious trial occurs at night and it goes through the night. Only one portion of it is in the morning. The purpose of this religious trial is to find a conviction that they could bring against Jesus that they could then bring to the Romans and have him tried against Roman law. There is an overlap here between Jewish and Roman law. Any crimes against the temple were also punishable for death under Roman law because the Romans had understood that crimes against the temple might cause a riot and seeking to keep riots from occurring, they protected the temple with their own law. So the religious trial would seek to find a conviction against Jesus for crimes against the temple. They had perhaps been alerted to this by Judas, some statements that Jesus had made. However, Jesus had made statements that seemingly were against the temple just two days earlier when he derided the Pharisees for their leading Israel astray and told them that the temple would be left to them desolate. Interestingly enough, the first person who Jesus stands trial before is not Caiaphas, the true high priest, but Annas, the one pulling the strings. Annas had not been high priest for about 16 years. He was high priest probably at the time when Jesus visited the temple when he was 12 years old. He was high priest in 7 AD and was deposed by Rome in 14 AD. Nevertheless, he continued to control the high priesthood through a series of sons, uh, sons-in-law and even a grandson who became high priest. When Jesus entered the temple in 27 AD at the beginning of his ministry and overturned the money tables, he had overturned the tables of Annas. He had overthrown what the Pharisees called the bazaar of Annas because he was making money off the temple sacrifices and the exchange of temple money. Three years later, just a few days before this trial took place, Jesus once again did the same thing. He overturned the money tables of Annas. We see here a personal vendetta from Annas towards Jesus. Annas, who is the one who truly pulls the strings in Israel, especially in the high priesthood, seeks to be the first one to try Jesus. And he has two convictions that he wants 
to find, one against the disciples and another against Jesus. So he asks Jesus for a witness against the disciples and against himself. He asks him to explain himself, to explain the disciples. And Jesus remains silent. He says nothing. Because Annas is breaking the law. Annas has no right to try him at night. It's nighttime now, and it's still before midnight, although the hours are closely approaching midnight. Annas has no right to be holding a trial right now. Additionally, this trial before Annas was held in private. There was only one location where the high priest was able to try a criminal, and that was in the uh, court of judgment, or the hall of judgment in the temple. This trial was supposed to be public, and it was not, and Jesus had no right to say anything. So Annas ships him off to Caiaphas. Caiaphas, being the actual high priest, has the Sanhedrin at his disposal. This is not a court of one, but this is a court of 71. Likely, not all of the 71 were present. We know that Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea were probably not there because they were believers. This court is, or this trial is taking place in the middle of the night, and it would behoove the members of the Sanhedrin who already decided they would put Jesus to death, to only wake up those members of the Sanhedrin who would convict Jesus, who would go along with this illegal proceeding. They needed a minimum of 23 members of the Sanhedrin to be present in order to bring a conviction against, um, against Jesus. So they had at least 23, and they had as many as 69 members present. However, once again, this is an illegal proceeding. All proceedings must take place in the Hall of Judgment, because all proceedings must be public and the people must know where to find these trials. Instead, it takes place at the private residence of Caiaphas. We see that it's quite a large residence. Many people are able to fit in the courtyard but he has gathered the members of the Sanhedrin to his own home in order to try Jesus in private in the middle of the night. The trial begins with these elders, scribes, and high priests trying to bring a false testimony against Jesus. In other words, the first step in their proceedings is to try to find a conviction. This was also illegal because all trials are supposed to begin with the defense of the defendant. This is backwards from how we do it today. A charge is supposed to be leveled, and then the defense is to make its statements. Here, there is supposed to be a character witness for the defendant first, so that the first impression of the judges is positive. This paints the defendant in the best possible light, rather than beginning their sentence in a negative light. Immediately, they are disregarding any character witnesses for Christ, and they are searching only for false testimony to convict him. We also see that every single member who was present was going about this task of finding a false testimony. This was a unanimous prosecution. This also broke the law, because although everyone could argue for innocence, not everyone could argue for guilt. If everyone was arguing for guilt, the case would be thrown out. All of these laws, or most of these laws at least, were trying to guard against conspiracy. The defendant need at least, needed at least one defender among the judges. We see that there are lots of attempts to bring two witnesses that would corroborate perfectly a conviction against Jesus. Two of them come close. One says that Jesus said he would destroy the temple made with hands, and after three days he would build another temple without hands. But the other one said Jesus said he could 
do this. One is a statement of intent, which if it were corroborated by a second witness, would be a crime that Jesus could be tried for. But the second witness did not say that Jesus intended to do this, but only said that he could do this. This is a statement of power. This could not be leveled against Jesus, and apparently this was their strongest witness case. And so they failed to produce any witnesses. Now, in a Jewish court proceeding, failure to produce witnesses means the case gets thrown out. Instead, they proceeded anyways, without witnesses. And Caiaphas, in his frustration, asks Jesus to be his own witness, to declare whether or not this testimony was true. In other words, Jesus needed to corroborate the witness of the one so that there would be two witnesses. But under Jewish law, it is inadmissible for a person to be his own witness. This always runs the risk of the defendant being suicidal, or else, more likely, defending someone else. We saw this in the Garden of Gethsemane at the arrest as well. Even though Jesus declared himself to be Jesus of Nazareth, the one whom they were looking for, no arrest was made until Judas kissed Jesus on the cheek. Because Jesus could not testify of himself being Jesus. They needed the testimony of Judas. Because Jesus could have been some sort of decoy for the true Jesus. He could have been one of the disciples claiming to be Jesus. From a human perspective, that would make sense. They didn't want to arrest the wrong man. They waited for Judas' betrayal. Now, Jesus, once again, didn't answer. Caiaphas got frustrated and said, Tell us, are you the Christ, the Son of God? Are you the Messiah, the Son of God? Interestingly, Caiaphas is combining these two terms. Perhaps there was an early expectation of a divine Messiah, or perhaps the claims of Jesus had been perfectly clear to him but he needed corroboration for that. Are you the Christ, the Son of God? And Jesus said, you have said it, which was a Hebrew and a Greek idiom for yes, indeed. What you have said accurately represents the truth. Jesus here claims once again to be God, and Caiaphas tears his robes. This breaks an 11th law. This is directly, again, from the Law of Moses. The high priest is not allowed to tear his robes, even in grief for the death of a family member. The, the high priest must remain a neutral party. If you've ever seen the State of the Union address with the president, you see a lot of people clapping for some things, a lot of people clapping for other things, and then you see the nine Supreme Court justices sitting in the front row with no reaction, no clapping for anything. They are neutral. And the high priest is to be the same since he stands judge. He is supposed to be like our Supreme Court justices. Instead, when he hears Jesus claim to be God, he tears his robes, perhaps in a theatrical gesture, to try to get the other Sanhedrin members to overlook the illegal proceedings so far, and to become emotionally involved in this trial. Because the new conviction that they will try to bring against Jesus is one of blasphemy. Caiaphas tells the members, look, he has blasphemed. Do we need any more testimony? Unfortunately, this broke a 12th law. An accusation could not originate from the judge. He was a neutral party. We'll see this judgment goes really fast. Caiaphas makes the pronouncement and quickly moves through breaking another 10 laws, trying to force through this conviction. The conviction on its face was false because under rabbinic law, the charge of blasphemy 
could only be brought for one who verbally pronounced the four-letter name of God. Jesus had not done this. Jesus did not break any law by claiming to be God, especially since he was speaking the truth. Additionally, he could not be condemned by his own words. He would need, once again, witnesses to corroborate, and they could not be the judges. They're kind of between a rock and a hard place here, but they keep pressing forward. Caiaphas says we need no more witnesses. He is guilty of death. They pronounce the verdict right away. Unfortunately for the Jews who were doing this, it is illegal under their own system to pronounce any verdict at night. The proceedings were not allowed to begin at night, which they had, and they were not allowed to conclude at night. If a trial goes into the night, the verdict, whatever it may be, has to wait until the morning. But here the verdict is given at night. Additionally, since the verdict was one that comes with the sentence of a capital punishment, they have to wait another 24 hours. They cannot pronounce the judgment the next morning. They have to wait until the following morning. Because the result of this conviction would be death, they needed to be extra careful. They needed to give the defendant every opportunity to levy his defense. As well, with a conviction that would lead to death, they cannot take it by a crowd vote. There is no applause meter here for this one. Each member would individually have to state guilty or innocent, and they would need to start specifically with the youngest so that his verdict is not outweighed by the verdicts of his elders. They want the unswayed opinion of each member. This was ignored. Jesus was pronounced guilty of death by a crowd vote. As well, every single one voted for guilt. Not one voted for his innocence. Now in this Jewish system of law, Everyone could vote for innocence, but not everyone could vote for guilt. They believed that it was impossible for 23 Jews to agree on any one point unless they had conspired together. So a unanimous vote of guilt resulted in an innocent conviction. They continued as if he had been proclaimed guilty. This was an innocent proclamation under Jewish law. Not only that, when they convicted him of this blasphemy, falsely, they didn't wait to announce the sentence. They said he was guilty of death. They sentenced him immediately. Now the verdict was supposed to wait an additional 24 hours and be announced in the morning. And then they were supposed to wait yet another three days to announce the sentence, to allow all possible time for the defense to bring more evidence. If they had followed their laws, they would not have started the proceedings until two days later. A sentence, if found, or a conviction, if found, would not have occurred until a day later. And then a sentence would not have occurred until three days later, meaning this should have taken a week at least. The following week was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. This might have taken two weeks. But they rushed it through in a matter of hours. In fact, as we'll see, they rushed it through in about three hours. Once they reached this conviction and this sentence, they began to beat Jesus, to mock him, and even to scourge him. Now, Jewish scourging wasn't as bad as Roman scourging. The leather whips were short, and they didn't have bone, metal, or glass embedded in them. They were not meant to fillet a human, 
but to punish a human, and they were limited to 39 strikes. Nevertheless, this broke a 20th law because the judges were supposed to act with kindness and humanity, even to one who was convicted. A 21st law was broken in that, especially in the case of one sentenced to death, they were not to be beaten at all before their execution. They were to be untouched until they were stoned. And lastly, this entire proceeding happened on the evening of the Passover. This broke the law because no proceedings were allowed to take place the day before the Passover, or any feast for that matter, or the Sabbath, because necessarily the conviction would need to be brought the next day. And that would be a feast day or a Sabbath, and it could not take place on that day. So in the morning hours, between midnight and 3 a.m., this trial before Caiaphas was taking place. We know that because two of the disciples returned to Jesus. They followed this cohort, and they followed them probably first to Anna's house and then to Caiaphas' house where they could actually enter. And John tells us that they were able to enter because he was known to the family of Caiaphas. John was a or belonged to a well-off family. His father was a perhaps fishing mogul, you might say. He would be known by the high priest, and when the high priest's servant girl saw John, she let him in. And then John persuaded the servant girl to let Peter in. Unfortunately, this became the stage of Peter's betrayal of Jesus. John was doing him a favor, but Peter did not use that favor well. It was this servant girl who first accused Peter of being a disciple of Jesus, to which he said, no, I'm not. Now, once he said this, the cock crowed for the first time. Now, interestingly, we discover that fowl were not permitted to be raised in Jerusalem. It ran the risk of ceremonially defiling the city. And so there would be no chickens, no roosters in the city of Jerusalem. But this is no issue because we find from rabbinic writings that they called the different watches or the calls for a different watch a cock's crow. The first was at midnight, the second was at 3 a.m., and the third would be at 6 a.m. And these signaled the different watches at night. Idiomatically, this was called the cock's crow. So Peter entered the house and was accused of being a disciple of Jesus, which was true, at midnight that night. It says that after a little while, this slave girl comes up and makes the same accusation again. Once again, Jesus or Peter denies being a disciple of Jesus, and this time he says he denies it with an oath. He swears on its veracity. He absolutely is not. But he is in the court of Caiaphas. He is watching the proceedings of Jesus and Jesus' trial. He's standing with the soldiers, not the Roman soldiers. They would not be allowed in here, but with the temple police. And they heard this girl make the second accusation. And about an hour later, they asked him and they said, you sound Galilean. You must be his disciple. And he vehemently denies them at this. He is now talking to the temple police, not just some servant girl. He denies it once again with an oath. And Matthew tells us he started swearing and cursing. Now, this isn't swearing and cursing in the sense that we think of it today. Swearing would mean that he was making an oath. And cursing in Greek requires an object. And the closest object in the context is Jesus. He denies being a disciple by Jesus, swearing on the truth of his statement, and even cursing Jesus to prove it. 
But as soon as he does this, the cock crows for the second time, indicating it's 3 a.m. The doors to the trial with Caiaphas open, and there's Jesus, just convicted to death, looking at Peter. Peter sees him and begins to weep, and he flees. And Peter doesn't return until Jesus is resurrected. But John sticks with the procession. And John will stay there through his crucifixion. Now the proceedings ended at about 3 a.m. And this is important because they had to wait until morning. Once the morning sacrifices had been made in order to hold a real trial. They were well aware that this trial that they had done in the darkness of night was not a valid trial. They knew it would not stand up, especially against public scrutiny. And so they waited about three hours. These high priests who had stood there and convicted Jesus went about their business in the temple, offering the Passover sacrifices, not realizing that they were preparing at the same time the real Passover sacrifice. So between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m., a lot of things were happening. Jesus was awaiting a morning trial, and Judas was talking to the priests who were in the temple preparing these sacrifices. But this morning trial, when it did take place, it didn't take very long either. They already had the conviction they were bringing against him. All they had to do was get Jesus to repeat what he had said, in the trial before Caiaphas. This trial took place in the Hall of Judgment. The public would be watching. The Sanhedrin would be awake, the rest of them that is, and present, and ready to cast their votes. The votes were probably taken one by one, from the youngest to the oldest. They probably did all that they could do in order to give this any semblance of validity. They still did not succeed in doing that, but they did succeed in convicting Jesus and sentencing him to death. And so they went and began their civil trial of Jesus. Oops, and that's the end of my slideshow. So how did the civil trial of Jesus go? We actually want to begin with the death of Judas, because there is a problem here. Judas was supposed to stand witness in the civil trial before Pilate. But Judas was nowhere present during the religious trials, and now he is nowhere present for the beginning of the civil trials. The high priests didn't bother looking for him. Because in the morning hours between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m., he had met the high priests in the temple, told them he wanted no more part of this. He had betrayed innocent blood. He felt remorse, but did not believe in Jesus Christ. He felt guilty of what he had done, but did not turn to God in faith. Rather, he tried to solve it by his own means, returning the blood money that he had been paid to betray Jesus. He threw it into the temple, all 30 shekels, and he left. Now it says in Matthew that they didn't know what to do with the money because it was the price of blood. It couldn't be put back into the temple treasury to buy temple sacrifices. And so they had to do, or what, one thing that they could do with it was benefit the community by buying a field, a field in which they would bury dead strangers. So they bought a field called the Potter's Field, which became known as Akeldama, the field of blood, because it was purchased for the price of blood. And Judas was buried there. As well, about a million Jews were buried there 40 years later, after the temple was destroyed. This field belonged to Judas, because it was his money that purchased it. And so Luke, the writer of Acts, tells us that this was a field acquired by Judas, even though he was dead when he acquired it. 
Matthew tells us that Judas hanged himself. And Luke tells us that Judas fell headlong and split in half and his guts fell out. Some people see a contradiction here, but if you understand what would have been happening had they found a dead body in the city of Jerusalem on the Passover morning, it makes perfect sense. It was the custom of the Jews at that time if they found a body in the walls of Jerusalem on Passover morning because the city had to be ceremonially clean and a body would defile the cleanliness of the city. They had to dispose of it quickly, no time to bury it. It was their custom to throw the bodies over the wall facing the Valley of Hinnom, which was known as the Valley of Gehenna. They would throw it over the temple wall until the feast was over and they had time to bury the body. When Judas was found, hanged in the city of Jerusalem, they quickly disposed of his body, throwing it over the temple wall and his guts spilled out. So it tells us Luke the doctor. Now another issue that's a bit more difficult to solve, but actually has a very important solution, is that Matthew tells us this fulfills the prophecy of Jeremiah. And then he quotes Ezekiel. Ezekiel eleven thirteen, in fact, which was the prophecy of Ezekiel being paid 30 shekels, which was the price of God, the price of a dead slave. Judas purchased this field for 30 shekels, the potter's field. And this fulfilled the prophecy of Jeremiah applicationally because it had already been fulfilled in purchasing Jesus Christ. But it fulfilled the prophecies of Jeremiah literally, specifically the curse of Topheth. This field between the valley of Hinnom and the valley of Kidron, there was a little gully called Topheth. And this is where the Jewish kings of old, the evil kings, made human sacrifices. They burned their children to the idol Moloch. And God had condemned them for this and said that this valley would be filled with bodies to the point that it couldn't be filled anymore. And so in purchasing this field, Judas purchased the curse of Topheth. And he became the first body buried here under the curse of Topheth. And 40 years later, after over a million Jews were killed in the sack of Jerusalem, this was where they piled the bodies. No room even to bury them. And this fulfilled the curse of Topheth. And interestingly enough, it was purchased by the money that was used to, to make a human sacrifice once again just as the Israel kings had done before. The first trial with Pilate. Now, there's no 22 laws that Pilate is going to break, but there are two laws that are required for a Roman proceeding. And the first law, the first law was that the trials needed to be done in public. This was similar with the Jewish laws, but another law was that they needed to have a witness that would bring a conviction, and this would be the first step in this proceeding, unlike the Jewish proceedings. Now, Pilate had released a Roman cohort to Judas the night before, but when they arrive with Jesus and ask for a conviction, there's no Judas. So there's no witness, and Pilate asks them, what is his conviction? He doesn't know at this point because the one who had convicted him was not there and present anymore. And their response is, we wouldn't bring him to you if he didn't do something. Kill him. This is not a witness. Pilate tells them that he can't do anything. He says, go try him in your own courts. And they tip their cards a bit and they say, we have or we are not permitted to put anyone to death. Under their laws, they couldn't put anyone to death. Now, this indicated to Pilate that they weren't interested in trying a crime. They were interested in having him put to death. It was a trial in search of a crime, not a crime in search 
of a conviction. Israel had only recently lost its right to put a criminal to death. In the Talmud, we read that they lost this right 40 years before the temple was destroyed. The temple was destroyed in 70 AD, and that means that they lost this right in AD 30. Jesus' trial was taking place in AD 30, just a few months after this right was taken away from them. Perhaps it had even been taken away more recently than that. It was fresh on their minds. They knew they had no right to kill Jesus under Roman law and that the Romans would need to have him killed. And so they had tried to bring a charge that would be guilty of death under both laws. Now they brought up a charge against Jesus that was guilty under Jewish law, but not under Roman law. Blasphemy. And in fact, it's not until the very end of this civil trial with Pilate that they ever say that this was the charge that they brought against him. And so in looking for a charge, they start just listing charges that were possible. They tell him that this man was misleading our nation, perhaps indicating that he was leading some sort of insurgents, that he was leading a rebellion. This would need witnesses. No witnesses were present. And so this was easily dismissed. They said that Jesus told people that they weren't allowed to pay taxes to Caesar. This was demonstrably false by Jesus' own words and teachings that we saw a couple weeks ago. This would also need witnesses for which they didn't have because Jesus never said that. But here's another one. They said that Jesus claims to be the Messiah. He claims to be a king. Now this gets Pilate's interest. Because if Jesus claims to be the king of the Jews, then he claims to be a rival to Caesar. Notice, Pilate completely dismisses the accusation that Jesus claimed to be the Messiah. He doesn't care. That doesn't pertain to him. But the claim that Jesus is a king is worthy of being tried. And so Pilate goes and asks Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus asks him a question. Are you asking on their behalf or on yours? Are you asking from a Jewish frame of reference or a Roman? Why do you want to know? Is it because you want to know whether or not I am a threat to Caesar? Pilate indicates that he basically has no interest in the Jewish frame of reference he wants to know if Jesus is a threat to Caesar. Jesus tells him that his kingdom is not of this world. It's not of this realm. And it's not of right now. This is good enough for Pilate. He sees no guilt in Jesus. He is not trying to dethrone Caesar. He goes out and he tells the crowd, I find no guilt in him. The crowd is upset. And they start complaining and saying he's been causing problems all the way from Galilee where he started to here. And Pilate, hearing this, found a way that he thought he could get out of dealing with this headache. He realizes that Jesus is from Galilee, from the province where Herod has jurisdiction. So he sends him over to Herod. Herod and Pilate were both down in Jerusalem just for the Passover. Herod usually lived in Galilee, and Pilate usually resided in Caesarea. So it was only circumstantial that they were both there that evening, or that morning, rather. So Pilate sends Jesus to Herod, and Herod's excited because after Herod had had John beheaded, he started hearing about Jesus, all the miracles he was producing, and thought that it was John resurrected from the dead. Hearing about all the miracles that Jesus performed, Herod wanted to see these miracles to be entertained. We know that entertainment was always Herod's downfall, and this was the downfall of John the Baptist as well, since it was his daughter Salome's wish, after a particularly um, wonderful dance performance, to have John the Baptist's head on a platter. So Herod willingly agrees to have Jesus come and stand trial before him, and the high priests stand there convicting him vehemently. But Herod wants one thing. He wants to see a miracle. He wants to be entertained by Jesus, and Jesus remains silent through the entire trial. This has nothing to do with his trial. Herod is upset, and he mocks Jesus. 
He robes him in kingly garb, which was the, uh, which was what was being tried, whether or not he was a king. And he sends him back to Pilate. If Jesus wouldn't entertain him, he'd entertain himself. When he goes back to Pilate, Pilate's a little perturbed. He says, I have found this man innocent. Herod has found this in man innocent. So let him go. And the Jews would have nothing of it. So Pilate says, all right. There is a tradition on the Passover that we release to you one criminal. Pilate realized that the mob that was seeking to have Judas or to have Jesus tried and convicted was being led by the high priests. And he perceived that this was probably because of jealousy or envy. And so he wanted to propose to the people a choice that would be clear, a choice that they didn't expect. Do you want this murderer who is convicted of uh, sedition, of murder, all these crimes that they've tried to bring against Jesus, that he was a rebel, that he tried to overthrow the Roman government. Do you want this man, Barabbas? Or do you want this man, Jesus? In Pilate's mind, the answer would probably be clear. All right, if we have to choose one, give us Jesus. We can go home. But, providentially, Pilate's wife had had a dream that night. And she said she was pained in her dream because of this man and that Pilate needed to have nothing to do with this righteous man. This was just enough of a distraction, just long enough, for the high priests to convince the crowd to vote for Barsabbas instead of for Jesus. Now, interestingly enough as well, Barabbas, not Barsabbas, Barabbas is not a name, it's a title. In Aramaic, it means son of the father. In rabbinic writings, we learn that his name was Yeshua Barabba, meaning Yeshua, son of the father. This was Jesus' name as well. This was Jesus' title as well. This was what the Jews had convicted Jesus of, that he had claimed to be the Son of God, that he claimed to be the Son of the Father. And so it is a fitting replacement that this man who was actually guilty of crimes was replaced by Jesus, because this is how our sins are taken care of as well. Those sins which we are actually guilty of and which he is innocent of, he takes on himself, and we are forgiven. Jesus took Barabbas' place on the cross that night. Barabbas should have been hung between the other two criminals. Instead, Jesus was. And the same goes for each of us. Now, they want nothing to do with having Jesus released. When he releases Barabbas to them, he says, all right, what do you want me to do with Jesus? And they say, crucify him. He sees that they are bloodthirsty. And so he takes Jesus and has him scourged. Now, this is not a Jewish scourging. This is Roman scourging. The whips are longer, wrapping around the whole body, ripping flesh from the chest to the face, to the loins, to the legs. The whips had metal and bone and glass embedded in them so that while you would be welted after a Jewish scourging, you would be stripped so that muscle and bone was showing after a Roman scourging. Where a Jewish scourging was limited to 39 lashes, a Roman scourging was not. Where a, Rome, where a Jewish scourging never resulted in death, a Roman scourging often resulted in death, but Jesus did not die. These Romans who were scourging him decided to have a bit more fun with him. They twisted together a crown of thorns and they put it on his head, mocking him for this claim to be a king. And they put on 
a robe as well, mocking his claim to be a king. And in doing so, Jesus took on himself the curse, the curse of sin that had come from the Garden of Eden, which resulted in thorns, and it resulted in the need for a covering. And Jesus would become that covering, and he would become the end of the curse as well. But when Jesus was brought back to Pilate after this scourging, he asked the people what they want to do with Jesus, and they once again said, crucify him. And he asks them why. And they said, because he claims to be the Son of God. And this apparently gets Pilate shaking in his boots, and he quickly goes and he asks Jesus, where are you from? Jesus didn't answer Pilate. Pilate tells him, don't you know I have the right to set you free or to have you crucified? And Jesus tells him, you have no such right. Unless it were given to you by heaven. Pilate goes out to the crowds that are calling for Jesus to be crucified. And he washes his hands. He tells them that he is innocent of this conviction. This symbolic gesture doesn't actually release him of his guilt. But the people who were there said, his blood be on us and on our children. The Romans are guilty of putting Jesus to death. The Jews are guilty of putting Jesus to death. In fact, we and our sins are guilty of having Jesus put to death. The Jews are not under any particular curse through the generations this was a curse brought only on the first generation of Israel. They themselves took on the blood of Jesus and for their children as well. And for that, the judgment of AD 70 waited 40 years. Just like in the wilderness, 40 years transpired between the first generation and the second generation. The difference was in the wilderness, the second generation entered into the promised land. But in this judgment of AD 70, it was the first generation and their children that endured judgment in AD 70. And that is the end of having Jesus' blood put on the Jews. It was only for that specific people group. He makes one final attempt to have Jesus released, and they call for his crucifixion. And Pilate releases him to be crucified by the Romans without a guilty verdict. So Jesus, who was perfectly innocent of all sins, innocent and able to take our sins on him, was tried even in a human court and found innocent. Even in a kangaroo court that wanted everything to convict him, could not bring a conviction by which he could be sentenced. And so Jesus, an innocent man, under human law and under God's law, was hanged on a cross for the sins of the world. All right, I do have a last slide. Next week, if you've already done the readings for last week, the only thing new to read is the rest of John 19. Matthew 27, Mark 15, and Luke 23, as well as John 19, cover the crucifixion of Christ, which we will look at. Next week, this is Lessons 176 and 181 in your manual. Uh, now, I should tell you we've got next week the crucifixion, and then I'm adding one more week, if you are able to make it, to the uh, schedule. So it won't end on the 13th, we will end on the 20th. And uh, that will be the resurrection and the ascension of Christ. So I hope you can join us for the next two sessions. We have two left. Let's pray. Dear Father, we are so thankful for your Son, Jesus Christ. We are thankful that he came and endured all of the pain and the suffering and the trials that we endure on this earth under the curse, but that he took on so much more, that he was humiliated and that he was beaten and that he took on pains and difficulties that none of us will ever experience. We thank you that he endured this suffering on our behalf and because he loved us enough to die for us. We thank you and we praise you for the wonderful blood of Jesus. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, amen.